Um, good morning. Uh, I, I confess I'm probably the singularly most least qualified person in the room when it comes to leather chemistry, but um, uh, it's an honour to be talking to you about this, this National Leather Collection. Um, and yeah, what I want to do in this hour is just explain a bit about what the National Leather Collection is, um, perhaps pique your interest in some of the, the treasures and some of the, the activities we get up to, and, um, and as I was saying, a leading industry authority in the room has just explained to me that there's, there's roughly 23 million square feet of leather produced every year. Um, and uh, wh when you consider how much heritage and how many years of history have gone into to such, a, such a global industry, I think it's really important that the, the NLC is, is in existence. Um, and uh, yeah, long may it continue. Um, let's see if the technology works. Um, I'm not going to dwell on all the board. These are the sort of slides that I bring to the, the, the local talks at the U3A and the WI, and I, I thought I'd bring them just as an introduction, but, but um, I'm not going to talk in any detail about these because I fear I may get heckles from the back. But suffice to say, leather um, has a standard definition. Um, it's, a, it's, it's probably one of the man-made earliest materials. Um, the honest answer, I think, is that nobody knows exactly who or how leather was invented. Um, the, the sort of most probable assumptions are that sort of semi semi tannages were developed by almost by accident by our medieval ancestors. Uh, uh, sorry, our prehistoric ancestors. Just come on. No. Um, so if we go back to sort of 17,000 BC and our, our, our cave hunter gatherer ancestors um, looking for food, uh, they they kind of discovered quite quickly that the food came neatly wrapped in this, this outer layer, which was impossible to eat, but had many, many other uses, um, which could, call, could be used for protection, could be used for um, uh, shelter. Um, the problem with it was, obviously, that it rotted, and it was smelly, and it didn't last very long. Um, but we, we think that uh, early semi tannages like smoke tanning, or, or oil tannages like brain tanning, um, were the, the, the first developments of, of how mankind came to, to, to use this amazing material. Um, is that better? Is that, is that better? Am I confusing people by waving the microphone away? Um, it's very sensitive. Okay. Um, and uh, I think it's fair to say that ever since man came out of the caves, or ever since if you look to the beginning of the Bible in Genesis 3, when God sent Adam and Eve out into the out from the Garden of Eden, he clothed them in hides and skins. Um, it's, it's, it's a reasonable assessment to say that leather is man's earliest manufacture. Um, and it is such a versatile material. Um, and our, our story in the National Leather Collection takes you from these, these sort of early prehistoric manufacturers, the, the early hand crafting leathers of what we've done with them, right through to, to, to modern tanneries and the industry that, that you know and are all part of today. Um, and I think there are two key statements that can, can does that still work? I think the battery keeps going. Take this one. Is that better? Yeah, that's better. The other one was doing better. Well, maybe it's just interference. Okay, I can hear myself. Um, and the, I think the two key statements for this, this whole talk is that firstly, we've never not used leather in our endeavours. To say, ever since the prehistoric day, came out of his cave and wrapped a piece around his feet, right through to to some of the most technologically advanced. Um, if you think about the, the nose cone of Concord, had leather gaskets in it to help it bend down. Um, it's it's just a, a material that's hidden in all kinds of everyday objects that people take so much for granted. Um, and, and the reason why that's there is because man-made materials have never bested the unique and versatile properties of leather. Um, if you think about your elbow for a minute, it bends like that for decades at a time and never splits. Um, your whole body gives out all that moisture in a hot, sweaty day like this, but yet it will protect you from the rain in, um, in the most extreme climates. And nothing that mankind has um, uh, been able to produce, e either, either by endeavour or invention, has ever bested the unique properties of this naturally occurring material. Um, so it's important, right? Um, it's, it's the mainstay of everyone in the room's industry. Um, uh, but the question I'd ask you is, where, where's the museum then? Where's the heritage kept? Where, where is the story of what man's been doing with leather um, being preserved? Uh, and, and that was the, the question that in, in 1946, 
in London um, that uh, a group of uh, people not too similar to yourself uh, also had. That was the question they had. Um, and as you can see on this slide here, see in 1946, they, the, the, um, the founders of the museum thought that a museum would be of great value to the leather industry, but also it would fill a gap in the national collections, which in no case display leather as a material that has its own place in civilization. Um, and for a, for a country like the UK back in the 1940s that was leading the world in heritage, the National Gallery, British Museum, Victoria and Albert Museum, it was the, the go-to destination in the world to understand how we steward the stories of our planet. Um, for leather not to appear in any significant way in that was a massive gap in the national collections. So in 1946, the, the industry is clubbed together um, and they asked of this man, John Waterer, uh, the, the, the challenge of starting uh, a museum dedicated to the story of leather and leathercraft. Um, I don't know whether any of you know who this chap is, John W. Waterer. You, you might have heard of some of his books. Um, John was a royal designer for industry um, who, uh, best describe him, he was a, if I had to describe him in modern parlance, he's, he's an equivalent of what James Dyson is to the electronics and vacuum industry today. He was the leather industry back in the 40s and 50s. He wrote wonderful books, of which I've got a selection on the table here. Um, he was a real polymath. He was, he was on the local um, and, and the national news regularly talking about the, the, the versatility of leather. Um, he appeared on the very early BBC in the 1940s um, with these two objects, these two 17th century blackjacks in, in actual fact. Um, and John was given the challenge of leading the story of telling heritage in leather um, because he had a passion for design and using it. His day job, he worked at a company called S. Clark & Co, who, who, who made luggage um, for an industry that was absolutely booming globally in the 1940s when air travel had become popular and um, people like you and I could finally jump on a plane and go to Lanzarote for the weekend, but, but we needed some kind of protective case to take, take our clothes on an airplane. So, so John was a very influential man, man in the the leather industry, um, and a combined group, a consortium with, with, that was made up of the, um, the, the Saddlery and Harnesses Manufacturer Association, the, the Leather Sellers Company in London, the Saddlers Company, and various other leather companies clubbed together, gave John £5,000 in 1946 and said, go start a museum for us. Um, so John rubbed his hands with glee. Um, called a meeting, um, and the, the, the museum's first meetings were, were almost like a version of a sort of show and tell at school time. People would turn up, he would choose his friends from the industry whom he knew would have a network to, to get objects. The, the, the remit of the museum was collect objects that would tell the diversity of the uses that mankind had put leather to, and to celebrate this material in all its forms. So to be a repository of knowledge for the industry, so that from the layman like myself right through to professionals like yourselves would have a, a, a place to go and to access information so we could learn from the past. So in 1946, he called his friends together, he rocked up to a meeting with these two leather blackjacks, these thick cowhide blackjacks from about 1630 that we would have used to carry drink around, beer around within England in, in, in the um, 17th century. Um, they're, they're huge, they stand, they stand about sort of two foot off the ground, these things. They're not one person's pint of beer equivalent. We weren't just massive alcoholics in the 17th century. Um, these were the things that you would send your servants down to the local pub with to pick up a whole ration of beer for the family for the whole day or possibly two or three days. Um, back in those days, of course, beer was much more uh, healthy to drink than the water because it's been fermented, um, it, it had been brewed. Um, so you would give your kids the, the lower, the smaller beer with less alcohol and the, the, the chaps would drink the, the, the top stuff. So he spent five pounds on these two acquisitions in 1946 and he told his team of trusty seekers to go and do likewise. So the challenge was they would meet every three months and people could turn up with items they bought as long as they had not spent more than five pounds they had carte blanche to purchase whatever. Any purchases over that, they would have to consider as, as, a, as an, um, an organization. Um, and, and John's point man in all of this, I think John's almost prop in this, was, was a, a chap called Dr. Claude H. Spires. So again, some of you uh, might have heard of him from previous SLTC journals or from, from the Leather Sellers Technical College at History um, based in London. 
Um, Claude was a really quiet, unassuming man. Um, it's been a real struggle trying to find anything about him, actually. Um, the, the best we have is anecdotes from Joyce Mead, who is John Waterer's uh, daughter. Um, we know that Claude was a, a very erudite after-dinner speaker, but mainly kept himself to himself. Um, and for many years, he, he was the, um, one of the lecturers, the, 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 the teachers, the educators at the Leather Sellers Technical College near Tower Bridge, based near Tower Bridge in London. Um, he was educated at Emmanuel College um, and was an eminent leather chemist. And I think between Claude and John, they were the, the kind of spark behind this museum. Claude would visit John in London very early. They would discuss all of these books that, are, that, that they wrote together. Um, and, and they began this wonderful journey of acquiring amazing objects from everyday life that were all connected by the one fact that they are made of leather. So here's just one average example. This is a, this is a chap called, um, what's his name now? I forgot his name now. Mr. 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 Folsom, who was a, a, a hawker from a Country Life article in, in 1905. Um, and just in that one picture, you've got this past pursuit hawking, which is not considered a, a, a very popular sport now, but all of the hawking hoods and leashes were made of veg tanned leather. Um, and this wonderful pair of 1914-era boots, World War I trench boots, the, the, the kind of things that everybody was walking around in, using as part of their daily lives, it all relied on leather. Um, John and Claude also set up an international network of correspondence. Um, anybody had a question about leather from a school kid right through to this lady who was writing from the other side of the world in 1952. This is a, I think this is a Mrs. S.J. Butt who, who sent John and Claude a piece of tanned kangaroo skin in 1952 and said that um, the letter sort of explains how tanning in Australia is, is, is still emerging and um, uh, we're, we're still learning a lot from immigra immigrants coming over from other countries at this time here's a piece of kangaroo skin that we're up to at the time. So before the internet, before the age of mass communication, John and Claude was, was forming the, the beginning of uh, a repository of information for, for leather and leather craft. Um, we have all of Dr. Claude Spires' uh, teaching aids now. Some of these things had uh, clogged up a back room at the University of Northampton for many years, in actual fact. But um, these are all the old glass bell jars that, that Claude and his team would show you the different um, vegetable extracts that, that you could tan with. Um, I don't know whether you can see in the bottom left there, you've got a, a piece of lizard skin with a tick on it. So there was all the, the kind of nasty bugs and things that were affecting hides and skins for the industry as well. So, so this, this collection really was to tell the story of everything that you need to create leather right through to all the uses that leather has been put through in many centuries. Um, we've got wonderful uh, mystery chemistry books in our collection. Uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of the Pavlova Gloving Company, Pavlova Leather, which was a very, very soft um, uh, uh, fashion leather. Um, and this is the original recipe book from the Pavlova Company explaining how, how you would make Pavlova Gloving Leather. So we've got a, a, an archive of amazing treasures of, of people exploring and researching and developing leather tannages from the past. Um, here's a 1914 um, industry sample book with, the, with, with pages upon pages of different samples of, of tannages and different um, quantities of, of chemi chemicals going into it. Um, it uh, and it's, it's all been preserved and collected, not with any direct uh, thought for what it might be used for in the immediate future, but knowing that if we don't preserve our past, we, we will we'll regret it. There will be a time when you'll look back and go, wouldn't it be good if we had collection of objects. Wouldn't it be good if we, we knew what was going on in, in um, South American um, finishing houses in about 1920? Um, so they, they collected correspondence, they collected photographic evidence, they, they collected um, thousands upon thousands of glass slides to, um, to really just tell the world story of leather. Um, their first big outing to the public was in 1951. Uh, where they, they put on an exhibition which was part of the, the, the Festival of Britain when um, the, what was the Guildhall Museum turned into the Museum of London and when the Barbican was opened. Um, and this is the, the foyer of um, the, the, the Museum of London at the time. And you can see these various cases and displays, all objects that the Museum of Leathercraft had purchased in the first seven or eight years of their, their tenure. Um, and the records indicate they got many inches of column, many column inches of um, um, newspaper coverage and over 200,000 people visited 
So it really was started to be a national collection. It, it really was to fill that gap in the national collections um, because leather is such an important material. Um, they were writing to industry professionals of the day. This is, this is um, John writing to the CEO of Metropolitan Flexible Products in 1963. Um, and he sent him a pair of these Brazilian, I suppose they were work moccasins or slippers or something. Um, uh, but every single time I dip into this archive, I find another story that, that may or may not be interesting to everyone, but certainly will pique the curiosity of many. Um, so John and Claude uh, and their team of experts collected avidly, but I have to confess, the one thing that they, they kind of missed was they missed finding a permanent home for this whole collection. And by the 1970s, um, they'd really outstayed their welcome in the basements of leather sellers or saddlers or even the Guild Hall in London. They'd moved from place to place for several years. Um, but Northampton, as we all know, has a strong and rich tradition connected to the footwear and leather industry. And so in 1977, Northampton Borough Council approached John and Claude and said, we, we will loan your entire collection for 50 years. Bring it to us, we will put it on display, and it will be part of the permanent collections that we celebrate leather and footwear here in Northampton. Um, and so in 1977, that's what happened. The entire collection came over here. Um, but sadly, it was, it was a really dark year for the museum because within the space of six months, both John and Claude passed away. Um, uh, Joyce Mead, John Waterer's daughter, says it's really sad tale that in January of 1977 Claude was coming to see John for their usual catch up and chat and um, and he just didn't turn up at the train station and then a few days later or a few hours later they found out that, that sadly Claude had, had 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 a massive heart attack on the way to see John. Um, six months later John also passed away. Um, the museum had been saved in some respect because the collection was now all in the care of Northampton Borough Council um, but I have to report that for the next 30 or so years, that, that relationship gradually went into a bit of a, a decline. Without John and Claude at the, at the helm, the importance of this collection got rather overlooked, um, and the museum authorities in Northampton gradually put it further and further to the back of the cupboard as their objects and items took priority. So, um, my role started with the Museum of Leathercraft back in 2014, at a point when the trustees of the museum were concerned for its long-term future, um, when it was, as you can see from this slide, mostly boxed up in a, in a room at Abingdon Park Museum. It did have a, a small sliver of a, a display out at Abingdon Park. Um, and I, I, as I say, I'm not a leather chemist, I'm not a, a leather expert. Uh, my background is in national trust and heritage in general, and I, I got made redundant, and I, I confess I answered a, an obscure ad in the museum's journal, which said, um, we want someone to come and be the curator of this, this collection. I can, I can wing that, I can, um, I can tell them a bit about I'll, I'll read a bit about Wikipedia, what it says about leather, and I'll go and, um, I'll go and apply for that job. Um, so I was lucky to get the job. It was a, a four-year contract to, to, to reassess and to take this museum back to the public. Um, after being given the job, I was very encouraged and very excited to start. I said to the trustees, right, where do you want me to start? What, what messages do you want me to send out to the world? And they all kind of looked at each other a bit, well, it's, it's to do with leather, and it's in that room there at Abington. Um, there's lots of stuff. Um, and I think the reality was that this, this decline of 30 years had meant everyone assumed they knew what it was, but no one had really thought to look. Um, so, so my role for the first 18 months was, was really fun. Um, I have to say, it, it, came, it came with a Ken. Some of you know Ken. This is Ken Mokes hiding in between the boxes here. Um, Ken Mokes is a, a, a tanner for all of his life. Um, and if you're going to take on a job in a museum, you do really need a Ken to be with you, otherwise you're going to be in trouble. He's, um, he's fueled by bacon and egg sandwiches and coffee, um, and, and as long as you've got a Ken, you can do quite a lot. Um, and for the first 18 months, mine and Ken's role was to go through every one of these boxes, put a black number on them, and inventory every object to try and work out the full scope of what it was that we were curating. Um, upstairs, there was three and a half thousand books 10,000 glass slides, boxes of unsorted journals and theses, everything connected by it's got something to do with leather. Um, and so after 18 months and about ooh, getting on for 2,000 bacon and egg bat sandwiches, um, Ken and I had photographed 24,360, well taken 24,000 photographs um, and we catalogued what is just shy of 10,000 items. Um, the actual 
the, photog the, photo the photographic uh, archive, the, the slides, the books, etc. There's three and a half thousand library books that we've begun to duly classificate, classify, sorry, um, but we're still, still a long way from knowing the true extent of exactly what we, we care for here. Um, and what I wanted to do now was just take you through a, a kind of average day in the first 18 months where me and Ken were, were looking at these objects. Um, and, and the best way to describe it is it really was a bit like one of these storage wars programs where some people rock up and buy an unknown unit and there's some stuff in it. Um, and at the end of the day, they find they've got a, a treasure. But in our case, every box contained a treasure. Um, so an average day might look like this. I mean, some, some of the historic scholars in the room know, know quite a lot about this object. But um, you know, you'd open a box and you'd find a pair of three and a half thousand year old gazelle skin underpants from ancient Egypt. Um, or, or rather, it's the, the the, the, the loincloth holder. So if you can see the top right there, you've got some, um, top left, you've got these sort of nappies on these Theban slaves. They would hold those nappy type cloths on with these gazelle skin meshes, which is one piece of a garment. It's all one single piece of um, veg tan, uh, gazelle skin that is slashed to make those, those, um, those decorations. So it's one single piece that's been carefully cut into to lots of different sections, like you would make a uh, a snowflake out of a piece of paper by cutting different bits and then you open it up and it's, it's, it's all decorated. Um, to give you an idea of the significance of that object, the, I, think, I think you'll tell me this better, Lisa. There's two or three of those in the world? Um, there, there are probably more than that, but uh, I didn't know about these until I came to the museum and I've seen them. We have two in the British Museum. Two in the British Museum, yeah. And so, yeah, so, so two in the British Museum and we've got two samples hiding in a cupboard in Northampton. That's the kind of national importance that we're talking about there. Um, and then another day you might open a, a little black Morocco box, uh, Morocco leather box with um, vellum and parchment deeds in them. Obviously uh, not quite leather, but certainly uh, uses of hides and skins. Um, and John and his team were trying to collect deeds and, and uh, parchment samples from across all the centuries, as, as, as much as they could. And, and their 19th century pieces were, were um, these deeds that uh, um, were warrants from Queen Victoria to incorporate the, the British Submarine Telegraph Company. So one is, in 1852, the, the Charter of Incorporation of the British Submarine Telegraph Company, and the other in 1860 is, is their warrant to lay data cables across the North Sea to, to Europe. Um, so an important historic document in its own right, especially when you think that these are the founding documents of British Telecom. And again, they're hiding in a cupboard in Northampton. The British Submarine Telegraph Company grew and emerged and evolved, and were it not for these royal warrants, we wouldn't have all the mass communication devices that we have today. When you think that before that cable was laid, it would take several days to send a message by boat, by letter. After that, you could, you could send Morse code signals within minutes. Um, John and Claude also wrote to famous celebrities of the day to try and uh, represent the zeitgeist, if you will. And back in the 60s, one of the most famous people on the planet, or in, in the UK certainly, was Donald Campbell, who was smashing land and water speed records. Um, and it just so happened that Donald swore by um, the, the, the glove manufacturing dyke uh, of Melbourne Port in Dorset, Silas Dyke and Co. That he, he would only wear these specific gloves for holding onto the, the, the wheel of his, his land and, and water speed um, challenges. So the signed pair has, has ended up in the museum. And sadly, a year after this was, or well, less, just over a year, in, in July, the, uh, January the following year, um, Donald Campbell was tragically killed on Lake Coniston. Um, and then you would open another box and you'd see this wonderful decorated vellum casket, and then you do a little bit of the research and you find out that it, it, was, it was one that was owned by Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire, um, who, who was on, the, on the, the, the throne in Spain at the same time Henry VIII was on the throne in the UK. It was made as a little love token for him and his wife to, to carry their jewels around in. Um, and you, you look in the records and you see that the museum trustees <coughs> clubbed together and, and outbid the Victoria Albert Museum for this item back in the 19. 50s, to have it in this national collection. Um, and to find these kind of things in cupboards in Northampton with nobody giving a clue, having a clue what they are, it just began to raise the stakes on, on what this thing was. Um, far be it from being just a museum of leathercraft, it, it truly is the national collection of your industry. Um, we go into the 18th century and you have wonderful tales of pirates and buccaneers, um, beer mugs that would belong to a pirate called Will Watch. Um, and, and that curious looking 
uh, black thin object is actually a, a beer vest, a beer drinking vessel in the shape of a dag pistol, made in the sort of 1720s. Why would you make a beer bottle out of, in the shape of a pistol? Well, if you were travelling around the highways of the UK and people like Dick Turpin were out and about to get you, um, they'd think twice if they saw that thing dangling from your hip or dangling off the side of your your um, your carriage. Um, purely a fake thing, but obviously a response to a, time, a sign of the time. Obviously, when the danger passed, you can have a quick nip of beer to kind of settle your nerves before you carry on your travels. Um, across the Channel in the 18th century and 17th century in, in France, um, all the pomp and pageantry of the, the, the Louis. Um, and sort of in order on this, this slide here, you've got a, a book bound in the 1620s for the library of Louis XIII. So this would have been on the bookshelves in the Louvre before they'd even built Versailles. Um, and then you have a, a red-heeled shoe, which is contemporary with the, the reign of Louis XIV. Um, and fashion scholars will, will tell you that um, there's a famous portrait by Rigo of Louis XIV with his foot up on a, a hoof. And he's showing off these red heels, which is sort of a sign of his authority. Um, and all the males of his court followed suit by having these red-heeled shoes. Um, nowadays, it's the ladies that get red heels, because I think is it Christian Le Bouton has patented the... the, 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 the the red soul, um, but really he's harking back to, to 400 years ago and, and royal patronage. Um, any ideas what that other thing is at the top there? <coughs> yes, it's, it's, it's a pair of goat skin bellows with, with mice and ends to it, um, and it's a, a wig powderer. So that's the kind of Madame de Pompadour, Louis XV, you put powder in that and shove up your pompadour wig to, to make it smell nice despite all the bugs and beasties that are crawling around in it. Um, again, complete bonkers collection of objects, but connected by the fact that this is the, the end product of the, 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 the millions and millions of square feet of leather that are being produced every year. Um, if you think back to the Civil War in, in England, we have everything connected to warfare. Um, it's a sad but true fact that when there's a war, the leather industry does quite well out of it, or it certainly has done um, right up to the end of the Second World War. Um, Back in Northampton in, in the Civil War era, um, we were supplying both sides of the debate, or both sides of the war, with, um, with their kit. So, um, you know, Northampton's boot and shoe industry did incredibly well, um, but there is an anecdotal suggestion that the reason Northampton never became a city was based around the displeasure that the, um, the Restoration had with the fact that they were aiding and abetting Cromwell and his troops during, during the actual the conflict. Um, this most amazing um, buff coat, this uh, original Civil War buff coat, the, the trooper's boots, even the, the bows and buckles, all made of leather. Um, and you think also in the 17th century, you think about great fires. Um, Samuel Pepys, famous diarist, recording in 1666, the Great Fire of London. Um, we have this beautiful goatskin wallet that was uh, with in, inlaid with wire wool, uh, wire decoration um, that was a gift to him probably from his son-in-law. Um, but on the back of the Great Fire, London swore never again. We were going to put things in place to stop fires breaking out and decimating our country. Um, and what did they turn to to solve the problem? Well, they used leather. The fire buckets, the fire helmets, the copper riveted fire hoses, um, all made of different types of leather. Um, and then not to mention, I haven't put it on the slide, but not to mention all the horse and saddlery and harness equipment that would have been carrying these these, these horse-drawn early fire engines around, around the city. Um, right up to the early 20th century, that, that thing in the middle that looks a bit like a, a Doctor Who villain's mask is, um, is, a, is a leather hood, which is a prototype breathing apparatus that the fire brigade were trying out um, so that people could go into smoke-filled buildings. Um, and it's not just the breathing apparatus, there's a huge pipe at the back of it which would be collected to a set of bellows. And you would be using leather bellows to pump the oxygen in through a very long pipe. To, so, so you can see how, were it not for the material and the properties of leather, oh, so many different things in society would, would, would not have evolved, or we would have had a great job finding other solutions. Um, in terms of religion and faith, we've, we've been carrying the stories and passing on our religions and faith to generation to generation by writing them down on parchment and vellum for thousands of years. Um, one, one afternoon, I, I came back with, with lunch, I think it was a bacon and egg sandwich again, I'm afraid, from, from Ken's point of view, um, and he, he threw a little envelope across the desk to me. He said, there you go, that's what you're looking for, isn't it? And I, I, uh, I inquired, and um, this middle, tiny little fragment of 
um, alum toward leather, or jewib as it's called, um, is one of seven fragments of the Dead Sea Scrolls that we've got in the collection. Um, so you've got the story of some of the most important Judeo-Christian uh, artifacts that were discovered in caves in Qumran in the 1950s and 60s. Um, and parts of them have made their way to this national collection, but they're, they're not recognized, they're not on anyone's radar. Um, along with that, we've got a, a 9th century Quran, which puts it as one of the earliest pages of a Quran in the UK. Um, and some incredibly rare um, Amharic text, this, this little, little colorful red book in the corner, The Vision of Mary, and some, some, some Jewish, uh, there's a phylactery, like a prayer. Um, it keeps, keeps the Jewish word close to your head or your heart. You wear it when you're making prayers. And a complete goatskin roll, the Book of Esther. So, you know, to, to be able to tell the story of how leather has communicated faith, religion, um, beliefs since, since sort of a thousand, two thousand years ago, it's just remarkable. Um, there were rather what I would consider less exciting days where I was cataloging nine million pricking irons or um, the 700th click, clicking knife. Um, but that too, in its way, is, is really important. It's, it's an evolution of the tools of the trade. It's, it's a catalog of, we've got catalogs of all the variety of handheld tools, right up to the, 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 the skiving and cutting and shaving machines that, sort of, that, that are in all of the, 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 the archives and the books that we store. Um, some of them are peppered with little nuggets of asbestos. That's a, an asbestos line Stoker's mitt. That, that caused me a bit of concern to stick those in a plastic bag. Um, and we also have what I consider to be some quite current issues, um, because as long as, along with with all the sort of what I call mainstream leather, we have um, quite a lot of difficult furs and skins. Um, in, in this picture, uh, so starting with the easiest one, but slightly weird, I don't know you can see the little, little grey one in the middle here, and the, the pen tip gives you an idea of scale. That's um, somebody decided to tan a mouse skin. Um, I'm not quite sure what you would use mouse skins for. Um, next to that, you can see a whole zebra, and again, with the whole like, the, the sort of game hunting and um, certainly a, a right reaction to, to the atrocities of just hunting animals just for pleasure. Um, these sort of things are difficult, but there's a real foresight that John and Claude set up this museum, because museums are not there just to, set, to tell you the, the nice fun stuff. We're there to preserve what we've done in the past. We're a politically and neutral entity that, that curates objects so that people can remember the past. Um, some of that past is, is, is quite unpleasant, I would say. Um, bottom, bottom left there, that rather, oh, yeah, bottom right on this screen, this, this rather ragged looking thing here, and any ideas what that is? It's, it was made in the 1980s at Cambridge Research Labs, and it's a shoat skin. It's um, Dr. Robert Sykes, some of you may have heard of. Um, uh, it's it's, um, it's a, a genetic experiment of a cross between a sheep and a goat that, strictly speaking, shouldn't, shouldn't have survived. It was clinical and research waste, it should have been incinerated, but Dr. Sykes and his gang went into this research lab and were allowed to tan this shoat. Um, so now, 30 years on, the question remains, is it, is it, is it ethical to have it? Is it? Should it be destroyed? Um, the role that the Museum Association takes is that we, we talk about these objects openly and honestly, um, and should there be some kind of request to deal with it in a certain way, we, we will deal with it in that way. But it, it's happened, it's here. Um, I don't necessarily condone it, but it is a fascinating object in, in its own right. Um, we also have uh, the probably the largest collection of fur coats in, in Europe. Uh, the, the Victorian Albert Museum deaccessioned their furs in the 1990s because they, they felt it was not something they wanted to collect um, ongoing. But what do you do with nearly 300 fashion fur coats? You, you know, the thought of them being thrown away was something the v &A couldn't quite handle. So they, they, they passed the, them to the Museum of Leathercraft. Um, so we have a, a really, I think, an important, exciting role to play in, in telling the story warts and all, but in a neutral way. We're, we're not here to, to promote the fur industry by any means, but we're certainly here to say that it is, it is a resource. It's a natural material. It's been used for centuries, um, and, and arguably will be, continue to be used. Um, the question is, how do we use it ethically? Um, we've also got human skin in the collection. Um, this is a part of that poor chap there. That's what happens if you, you throw a, a, a chap in a peat bog in Denmark three and a half thousand years ago. 
Um, the, the natural tanning of the, the peat, the anaerobic conditions in the soil perfectly preserved this, this, um, this human. Um, he's probably one of the most important um, 20th century Iron Age discoveries on the planet. Um, and th through the, the anthropologist Dr. Thor Valson, uh, John Water was given a part of the belly skin of this tolerant man. Um, so you get a sense, it's naturally important stuff, but you probably, you know, forgiven that, well, it's, it's in a cupboard in Northampton, so it can't be that important, right? Um, and I think that, I, mean, I don't know how accurate these figures are nowadays, but the reality is, we're, we're the, the museum that tells the story of what we do with the wrapping paper. And whilst we eat meat as a society, whilst seven to nine billion people are on the planet consuming 60 to 100 billion land animals is the projection, um, we are here to engage the public in this um, in this debate. It is, it is. I think I think leather gets a really bad rap actually in, in the current society. It's always considered to be uh, more favourable to pursue alternatives, but leather is naturally occurring. Leather is sustainable. The the, 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 the industries that you all represent are are leading the way in te technology and pioneering sustainability. Um, so leather really is everywhere. In life, fashion, art, um, it links our earliest ancestors to our modern world. Um, and we also provide a role in this museum to, to promote good design and inspire craftsmen in leather. Um, here's some examples of some of the, the, the more artistic creations that we've acquired over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, the one thing that we're particularly proud of is, is this, this black doublet. Um, it, it was made by a, a fashion student called Amy Jones at the University of, I think she was in Wales. Um, and Amy entered what's called the Janet Arnold Prize for Costume about two years ago, where it's a national competition where you recreate a piece of historic costume. Um, she'd written to the Ashmolean, she'd written to the British Museum, she wanted to go and study their Elizabethan jackets. Um, they all said the same thing. Well. We're too busy. We're, you can turn up, you can't take flash photography, we're not going to take it out of the case for you. Every museum she went to modelled this kind of, who are you, you're very small and insignificant and we're very big and important. Um, she rang us up and we said, yeah, come along. Um, we sat her down at Abingdon Park, we showed her a, a doublet that we've got similar style and design from the, the 1580s. Um, and she was, well, I can touch it. Well, yeah, our role is to curate these objects, but they're your objects. We, I'm a museum creator, I don't own any of this. I'm, I just look after it for your benefit. Um, so she was busy counting the stitches and measuring everything she needed, and then she mumbled under her breath, oh, now I need to get the leather to make this thing. And of course, Ken's ears pricked up, and actually the, the guys at the university here made the leather. Think, did you make it? Yeah, I did. Yeah, you made the leather for her, didn't you? Yeah. Um, so they made the leather for it. So this is a great collaboration between the museum an independent person and, and the university here. Um, Amy went on and she won first prize back in tw late 2016, I think. Um, we don't own that object, um, and I haven't had much contact with Amy ever since, but that's the role of a museum, is to be a point of inspiration for whoever, whenever. Um, and, and I'd hope that, that, that um, we would encourage bigger museums to think like that in the future. Um, other things we've got on display here, we've got a, a torso that was made by um, uh, two designers called Patrick Whitaker and Keir Marlon, who uh, left art college about um, 20 years ago, and they now produce a lot of the, the costume for the movie industry. They most recently made um, Gold Godot's wonderful bustier for Wonder Woman. Um, so they're, they're top designers working in, in, in leather for, for the movie industry. Um, and we're also quite privileged to have some quite influential current designers on our board of trustees. Um, some of you, you may know Bill Amberg, who, who makes and designs leather in, in London right now. Um, and uh, he is really pioneering the way in terms of encouraging the sense of craftsmanship with leather. So what we do with our collection of wonderful objects that Waterer and Spires left us with is we don't just stick them in dusty cabinets and tell people you should be interested in that. We let people look at them, we let people think about what they mean, and let them come up with new ideas. Um, and here Bill's explaining a thing called stack, which is one of his ideas to stack off cuts of leather and then cut them on the horizontal to make like a veneer that you can use as a flooring. Um, and and it, it is a, it's a new idea and he's pioneering it, but it's based on the stack here of that Civil War trooper's boot that he saw in the museum's collection when he's been kicking around with, um, kicking around with us looking at the, the wonderful objects. Um, 
And, and Bill has this great way of explaining the, 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 the pioneering work and the pushing the boundaries of good design. It's just about playing. It's about having fun. They have a session once a month where him and his team kick a few ideas around. They, they make a few prototypes. Most of them end up in the bin. But the ones that go forward are the things that will be, you know, possibly decorating the walls of Harrods and, and high streets to come. Um, we also have a role in growing in this collection is preserving the memories of your industry. Um, I say this with the greatest respect, but sometimes you can be too close to something to realize how amazing the work you do is. You know, if your day job is, is pioneering in chemistry or working in a field that not, anybody, not everybody understands, my role as a museum curator is to, mind, to remind you that that's really important and we need to say that now so that in the future people can study what you lot were up to. Um, and uh, you know, some of you will know um, the Lake Axton Landman, who sadly passed away quite recently. Um, and for the past four years, whilst I've been building the collection, assessing it, we've also been growing it in terms of developing an oral archive. So he, he sadly can't be with us in person, but he's here in spirit today, if this works. Monday the 28th of April 2015, and I'm with Axel Landman, who had well, a distinguished career in the leather chemistry field. Um, and uh, yeah, Axel, tell me about your life. <laughs> well, uh, funnily enough, I wanted to be an academic, but uh, when it came to decision making, and, um, they wouldn't give me a grant for teacher training, but I could sort of choose any technology that I wanted. Right. And um, I happened to, uh, Northampton, I was in Northampton, brought up, and uh, um, leather was in fact one of the uh, things that was local, so I thought I would do a course in leather technology. And this was back in the night. I could, let him, I could listen to him all day. I, I was trying to work out a way to stop that out of respect for him. But, um, I, there's, there's an hour of that. Um, but uh, he's just such a great guy. I, I say, recorded him a couple of years ago. Um, and, and we've begun this oral archive. We've interviewed about 40 people now. Um, this is a bit of a pitch. We want to interview more, so please see me afterwards if, if you want to do, do that. We offer a pub lunch and a nice cup of tea while you're doing the interview. Um, because modern... Collecting information now is going to be so, so vital for the industry in, in 30, 40 years' time. Um, we also acquire things. Uh, this, is a, this is an ocelot coat that was given to us by a... Uh, we're, still a sorry, we're still acquiring objects. Chap walked in with this, didn't know what to do with it. His, his, um, his father was a gambler in Northampton. He was great on the, the dog track. And in the 1960s, he put down £1,000 on a 40 to 1 dog, and it came home. So just to give you an idea, a thousand pounds in the 1960s, you could buy a decent sized semi for that in the 1960s. Um, and the, the lab brooks and all the, ga the, the gambling authorities investigated this chap called Mr. Swaby. He was in all the newspapers. He was found completely innocent of any shenanigans. Um, and the first thing he did was he went out and he bought himself a Seamaster watch and he bought his wife the best ocelot coat that was on the, on the market in Harrods. Um, nowadays, obviously, that coat is, is not particularly well thought of in, by many people, but he didn't want it to be destroyed because it's the memory of his, his father and, and, and this, this, this 40 to one shot. So he donated that to the museum. And I, I thought I'd put that up there because it kind of poses an interesting question that we wanted to do as a museum. Is, is leather part of the fashion world for the future? All of these kinds of debates we want to have with the public. And I think we can do that for the industry in a neutral way um, to help inform the public. Um, just after Ken and I had finished our last bacon butty, uh, we got given a bit of a curveball in that the, the borough council asked us to leave Abington Park. They wanted to remodel, um, so essentially they too were going to make us homeless. So, so my role for the last two years has been about how do we reinvent this national collection. Um, I'm grateful in a way that the timing was such that we, we knew that we had something massively significant to, to, um, to, to shout about. Um, and we went looking for a new home, and we, we set upon a, a real central location. This is the view out of our windows, and that's the before shot of a 1,500 square uh, foot space, no, 1,500 square meter space, sorry, in the town centre. Um, over the last 18 months, we've developed it into the beginnings of 
the National Leather Collection's permanent home. It's, it's a bit rough and ready. Those of you that visited, um, you'll know our reception and biscuits are warmer than perhaps the space can be at times, but we're, we're growing the offer in this space. Um, and our ambition is that, that, that we do museums differently. We want to model um, that museums are yours, not ours, that they're, they're places to access information. Um, I'd be the first to hold my hand up and say, I don't have all the information. Um, I'll be the first to say when I don't know something. But curating a collection of this scope is about people feeling that they can come and draw from it, use it whenever they want. Here's a group of kids learning how to use a, a treadle sewing machine. Seems really basic. Even I didn't know that you used to use both feet. Because um, if you just use, you know, you sit down on it and you push away with one foot, it feels quite good. But if you think you're doing piecework in your house in the 1890s, and all you're doing is pushing with one leg after a couple of weeks. Well, one, one leg's going to be the size of a house, the other leg's going to have withered away to nothing. Um, so this lady was a member of the public. And she just explained that her grandmother used one of these, and this is how we do it. And that one story has now kind of been, been safeguarded. Um, and we also work with uh, disadvantaged children, and we, we try and bring the museum experience to people that wouldn't consider it something that they'd be interested in. Um, most people these days think that if I want to learn something, I'll just look on Wikipedia, or I'll, I'll just Google it. Um, the, the way museums need to survive is they need to model that, that we're actually, we can give you something more than just the information. We can let you get up close, we can let you develop what you want to do using us as the backdrop. Um, and this group of kids, uh, basically when schools are out, at the summer holidays and half terms, they're, they're, they're at they're in danger of getting into trouble very quickly. So the community puts on activities and calls them to do various things to keep them off the streets. Um, they came to us last year, they wanted to make a film. We said, well, can you do a publicity thing for us? And there was no holds barred. We didn't start with, you can make a film about our really important collection, but don't touch that, don't do this, don't do that. We kind of greeted them with a cup of tea, and uh, we, we said, here's some wonderful things, you do what you want with it. We didn't even edit it. Uh, sorry, we didn't even edit it, so what I'm about to show you is completely their own creation. And, and the thing that you need to bear in mind there is that none of them were particularly passionate about leather, um, but that's okay. What they've learned in terms of skills of how to produce a, uh, a short advert, how they've presented, you know, been in front of the camera. Our museum has been a catalyst for helping them develop whatever they want. Um, and we get some nice publicity out of it too. That's the role of a museum. It's, it's more messy, it's more interactive. Um, and I think it's the only way that museums are going to survive. I don't know whether any of you follow what's going on trend-wise at the moment, but certainly some of the majors in London are getting significant drop-off in footfall. Um, lots of, lots of organisations, the, the National Trust just appointed a new Director General this week, and she was very keen to promote how we need to bring heritage back into our urban environments. We need to re-engage with people where the people are. We need to take it to them on their level rather than expect them to come and kind of feed off what we want to give them. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm really glad that I get to be part of this rather, rather exciting organisation at its emerging time, because we're already doing that. Um, it's less about multi-million pound dioramas and cases full of wonderful things, and more about you tell me what you want to access and I give you that access. It really is your museum. Um, where are we going now? Um, yeah, so, so last, uh, about two, three months ago, um, we were very lucky to be visited by ITV News, um, and I thought this, this is quite a useful 
um, little short to, to sort of sum up where we're at right now um, as I begin to conclude. A boat, a golf ball, and a shield. It's not every museum that boasts such a varied and apparently disconnected array of items. But they all do have one thing in common. We've got items that tell the world story of leather from over 3,000 years ago right through to the present day. Um, some of the more fascinating things we've got, we've got rare fragments of the Dead Sea Scrolls. We've got a, a 2015 Jaguar F-type steering wheel in the finest stitched leather. So we have this wide range of items, all made of this one material, leather, that's been around since the dawn of time. Mostly recovered from a collection at Delafray Abbey. All the artifacts have been made with the utmost of care. Skilled workers laboured over every detail, captured here at the peak of their craft. Even Samuel Pepys' wallet is here, or, for the more modern gentleman, a pair of shoes worn by the man himself, James Bond. And there's more in the back, too. There are all sorts of items here, everything made of leather, of course. Buckets, chair, saddle, chair, some slightly more bizarre objects. And of course, any more fashion she was in would be fully complete without some kind of shoe. It's cost £180,000 to get to this point, a shoestring for a collection of this size. For those volunteering here, it's a vital part of this region's heritage. There's such an important part of life in Northampton and its history. And the museum is really bringing that along for people, so giving them people the chance to actually handle leather, get bits of leather. Um, it's much more interesting than just things in dusty paper. I never realised how many things um, are made of leather and how versatile a material it really is. If people don't fully understand leather, they think it's just a, a pair of shoes walking around, but so many other things it can, can be used for. Now, these items that have been preserved for generations have found another home for at least a few years more. Mr. Graham Stopper, ITV News in Northampton. Um, and so we, we've come a long way in the last 18 months. We, we've opened a new space. I hope that gives you a sense of what we're trying to achieve there. Um, and, and really this is where I want to turn this lecture on its head and throw it open to you, because because this museum is a nationally important collection of objects, but it has the potential to grow even more. It, it can continue to be the, the kind of national beacon for your industry. But it's, it's about encouraging you to give us your stories, to think about your everyday job and potentially are there things that we, we're not collecting that we should be collecting. Um, it's not me begging for money. This is not a fundraising push. This is about questioning how much you value the industry that you've made your careers in. Um, it's, it's, it's continuing the fun that John and Claude had right through the 40s, right through to the 70s, um, and just enjoying it and paying a, a nutter like me to then take that to the public. Um, again, we, I, don't, I don't think curators and museum professionals need all to be complete experts in their field. Some of them need to be a bit more like Gary Lineker. They need to be like the football pundit that helps interpret the industry to the average person on the street. Because, because leather is a fundamental material that, that is propping up civilization. It doesn't get enough prom promotion. Hardly anyone has a full and robust understanding of what it is. And, and our role is to do that, is to educate the public. Um, so yeah, there's, we, we developed a, a website which we just love you to sign up and be part of our mailing list so that we can grow our network. Um, we're already doing all kinds of ancillary events uh, Monday. If, if you're here for the weekend and you want to come to our book night on Monday, we're, we're teaming up with some local authors. We've got a wonderful collection of fine bindings. Um, and between five and seven on Monday night, we've got local authors talking about their work and looking at these, these wonderful books and how literature has been conveyed through the centuries in beautiful leather bindings. Um, and if you haven't seen it already, this is a, this is a real shout out. We, we, we do quite a, quite a regular blog. Our ambition is to blog post at least one thing every week. Um, and here's a selection of the various things we've been blogging about for the past couple of months, from, from bindings to um, over Easter, we've got our 17th century Dutch panel with the crucifixion on, um, the, the, the James Bond shoes, um, military, uh, military bags. There's, there's, a, there's even a nice tasteful piece on George II's traveling portaloo if you Feel the, feel the need to look that up. Um, but do go to the National Leather Collections website and do follow. They're, they're, um, 
They're, they're microblogs, they're only a couple of hundred words long, um, but they're shedding light on the versatility of our collection and why leather is so important. Um, and uh, yeah, if, if, if you do have a couple of million quid knocking around, we'd also love that too, but that's another story. Um, you can become a friend of the museum. Um, our ambition is not to, not to build a massive thing. Our ambition is just to care for this collection, to gradually grow it, to safeguard the stories of, of your industry and pass it on to the next generation so that, so that we as a society can, can hold our heads held high and say that you know, we still do heritage really, really well. Um, so that's it, yeah, thank you for listening. Um, thank you for putting up with me. Um, you don't, don't do questions, do I? I just, I just shut up now. Can we ask Yes, you can. Possibly next year, you might hold this conference there, might Yes, the, the, the main space, we can, we can sweep everything away, and it's a conference facility for at least 150, 200. Yeah. So you can all come and have a cup of tea with me next year, if you want. Yeah. <laughs>